Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is a, a very exciting time for St. John's. I'm Lance Lockwood. I'm a member of the GSA and a member of St. John's, which I proudly say. St. John's United is a wonderful place. We hope that you can come and visit us someday. Before we start this evening, I just have some housekeeping and some proper things. I'd like to acknowledge the land. Today we are thankful of to be live streaming from Mackmaki, the territory governed by the peace and friendship treaties. Our board has committed working towards reconciliation with the First Peoples of Canada by providing resources, educational programs. This is an ongoing commitment, a journey that has just begun. Together, we strive to live respectfully and with those around us, embracing differences to make a difference. Let us remember that we are all treaty people. I'd like to take a little bit about, i tell you a little bit about what pi is. Pi is a, a United Church uh, happening that about four years ago, started by uh, some people uh, one of whom will be our uh, guest speaker on Monday night, the Right Reverend Gary Patterson, uh, former moderator of the United Church, and that he will be doing uh, his presentation live, although virtually from Vancouver, and uh, there will be a Q&A after. So uh, that is truly something to look forward to. Um, hi is a, an organization or a way of correcting what is public? Yeah, public, intentional, intentional explicit. and explicit. So that's the meaning of PI. Tonight, we, will, we have the honor of having Dan McKay uh, here with us tonight. And uh, Dan, it comes with a, is known really well in the 2S LGBTAQIA plus community. He has been around and I'm, I'm just gonna wing it here. I think well over 30 years being involved in the, uh, <coughs> our community. And uh, we are so pleased to have him this evening. And uh, he is also the editor and manager of, uh, of Waves uh, magazine that uh, used to be a newspaper uh, live uh, or a newspaper print, and now it's online. And uh, many of you are probably hooking up to with us tonight from uh, reading that. So we welcome uh, Dan. Um, we had to make a few little changes here tonight, so we apologize for our startup. And Dan, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you being our first guest of. Uh, Pi Day uh, celebrations for two, 2022. We're really delighted to have you. And please tell us some more about yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lance. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, happy Pi Day. I'm looking forward to uh, some Pi uh, right after the presentation. Um, so tonight, uh, Lance, what I'm hoping to do is to uh, tell you Give you a little bit about uh, a little bit of a perspective of the history of the Q community uh, in Halifax, uh, and just for fun, um, I thought I would tell that via the story of the spiritual communities uh, in the city, uh, and uh, the history of both of those is super rich. Uh, that's one goal. Uh, the other goal is to is to show that uh, Halifax give people some idea of, of what a vibrant place Halifax has been for exactly half a century. Uh, we uh, and uh, I'll be uh, telling you about that. And the third thing, uh, Lance and audience, uh, is that I want to be convincing uh, both of you that this is a really great time to be uh, getting involved with uh, telling our history and contributing to our archives 
and uh, doing research and uh, volunteering in that way. So uh, that you'll see uh, little plugs uh, for that kind of service work uh, popping in and out uh, during the evening. I think we're going to get through this in about an hour. Uh, both uh, Lance and audience, uh, we intended to uh, answer questions uh, as we're going through this. And so if you uh, paste your questions online, I, uh, Annika, I think, will be reading them to me. And so I think we should get them. So uh, feel free to post questions. Annika will uh, uh, put up her hand at appropriate moments. And I'm pretty sure that's all going to work well. Uh, so we did our land acknowledgement. The other purpose of this map was to show where I'm from. I'm from right down here, this tippy, tippy, tippy southern tip of Nova Scotia. Uh, I, I was literally born right here. Um, Halifax, of course, is right up about here. And uh, uh, we'll see a little bit more about this area later. There's a, there's a historical, there are two historical events, one of which... Uh, I have a slide for one of which I don't. Um, so briefly, I'm gonna, just going to burn through uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my dad uh, here, that right down here, uh, my dad was kind of did plumbing and heating and kind of uh, uh, was a handyman. And believe it or not, in this tippy little southern, outside of this tippy little southern village uh, in Nova Scotia, there was an enclave of lesbian book publisher, Summer People, and they uh, they came to have, they had a, a cottage, it wasn't a cottage, it was a house, they lived in New York, um, and uh, they were extremely there. There were no walls, you could not see any walls in Aunt Mamie and Aunt Tessa's house, they were all, um, Every, every square inch was covered with books. And uh, they got me involved with books. This is me uh, at their house with their cat. This is the same cat here. Uh, and uh, we, uh, and it wasn't until I was a teenager that I realized that my parents were okay with Aunt Mamie and Aunt Tessa, who were obviously a couple, and I learned later had been a couple. They had rented the same, well, I went and visited them. They had rented the same apartment in Greenwich Village at 14 Christopher Street since 1938. They had lived in the same apartment together. But of course, I was a kid. The, the idea of them being lesbians, the L word, never occurred to me. My parents referred to them as old maids, um, which was the word at the time, right? what everybody called lesbians back then. And, uh, and there was also uh, Aunt uh, Maria uh, uh, and Aunt Marion. They were also involved with the uh, book stuff. <clears throat> Aunt Marion was a, uh, you wouldn't call her that these days, but at the time she was called an anthropologist and she was studying Mi'kmaq culture and she was publishing books about uh, Mi'kmaq uh, traditions. And so early on, that's what, one of the first things that I learned to read was books of Mi'kmaq legends. And, uh, they're still using up neurons in my head and I still love it. Some of the, your books still around? Uh, uh, you can find them used bookstores. Yeah, oh, okay. and you can find, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. This, I just got to get a, a slight, uh, a slight diversion here. Aunt Maria published a book called um, The uh, Encyclopedia of North American Folklore. Um, one day, a bunch of musicians, so this book that she, she wrote the whole book, she collected all of these legends and she published it, this encyclopedia book of American folklore. This is my Aunt Maria from here, from here. Um, one day there was a band sitting, standing around and they were probably all stoned to the gills and possibly drunk to the gills and they were, they were looking for a cool name for their band. And they opened my Aunt Maria's book and they flipped through it and they found a name that they liked, and the name was the Grateful Dead. Uh, uh, the and it's, it's a story. It's a it's a, a American story legend. Oh my God, I'm getting off track here. American story legend uh, about um, someone who dies, and their ghost is hanging around, and there's no money to bury them, 
And so the ghost hangs around this village and this visitor comes and says, this is terrible. I'm going to pay to have the body buried. And the ghost is so grateful that he then hangs, the ghost hangs around with the traveler throughout the story cycle and helps him out. And so the story cycle is called The Grateful Dead. The band is called The Grateful Dead. My aunt, uh, Mamie, named, my, I'm sorry, my aunt Maria Leach is, my aunt Maria Leach named The Grateful Dead. How cool is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, get back on the rear road. Get back on the back on track here, dear. Um, right. Uh-oh, having trouble with my road here. Okay, uh, this is me in high school. Um, this is high school and newspaper publishing. I got uh, hooked on doing publishing. Uh, this is me up here, this is me in the corner. This is my, uh, this is the head of the newspaper club at the school who, who later became uh, my Latin teacher in uh, senior high school. And uh, many of these people, believe it or not, are still friends. It was all 40 years ago. Uh, the, and at this point, I do presentations to uh, high schools fairly often, to, very often to uh, junior high schools. And it's at this point that I tell people that if you're in junior high, this is almost certainly the most miserable time of your life, especially if you're a little different, especially if you're not the most amazing person in the class. And it's okay for this to be the most miserable time of your life. It gets better from here. And so this is, this is my usual message here. This was a, this is junior high was a perfectly wretched time for me. Anyway, then, uh, so here's some work stuff. Uh, I worked for this beautiful blonde man who never wore a shirt and uh, wore a cut off Daisy Dukes at work. And as a 15 year old, it was mighty distracting, let me tell you. Um, and then I got a job in a print shop running a little press, almost exactly like that. Uh, and again, I got ink under my fingernails. And once you have that, it never, you never get the ink from under your fingernails. You've got to be publishing from then on. I worked in a museum for a while. I was freelancing for a while. I did a whole bunch of things, including uh, computer automated publishing of books. So I, someone would have a database and they would say, Dan, can you make the database into a book every day or every month, say. This is um, a catalog for a, a video store in Halifax called Critics' Choice. Uh, that was in the Carpenters Hall where Propeller is now. Uh, and they had a cool database. I built the database and they said, can you make a catalog for you? And I was like, oh, well, excuse me. Um, and so we printed the catalog every, uh, I don't know, every couple of, uh, every couple of months, fresh catalog of, um, of uh, videos. And then uh, I got hired to build the internet in Canada. Uh, and uh, Lance and Audience and Annika and uh, people on Zoom, uh, if you like the internet, um, if that's the internet's working out for you, uh, why well, you're very welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and I don't have any ego problems at all. Okay, moving along. Uh, if I want to. Oh, uh, this is kind of my perspective on um, faith communities, uh, Lance, and I, I hope it's not offensive. Um, uh, in, in the drawing here, we see uh, a teacher presenting, um, uh, maybe the pastor, uh, presenting their, the faith tradition that people are in uh, to a bunch of people, probably in something like confirmation class. Is that a United Church term? Do you yep. guys do con oh, yeah. confirmation? Okay, United Church confirmation class. Sorry, I do so many different faith experiences that I, it's hard to keep the, uh, anyway. And uh, and the caption reads, so this is where our movement got came along and finally got the Bible right. Uh, and, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, all of these uh, people uh, got the Bible right. Uh, I am just as happy to be, uh, belting out hymns with the Christians, or uh, trying to sing Hebrew, uh, or chanting with the Wiccans, um, or sitting with the Buddhists or the Quakers. I'm, I'm happy with all of these. Uh, one of my favorite people uh, in the world, uh, is one of his sayings is, uh, there are many paths to the divine. And so that's, that's, that's where I sit with that. Uh, and so you'll be seeing a very uh, multi, multi, multi uh, spiritual uh, experience tonight. Um, one cool thing, uh, last week, uh, uh, Lance, I was uh, at a queer church called Queer Spirit Church. It's the newest gay church, uh, LGBT church in uh, Halifax. 
It's being held at First Baptist, it's being uh, hosted by First Baptist Church, and they had a lesbian rabbi on the pulpit delivering the sermon. And I'm very grateful to be living in a city where there can be a lesbian rabbi and the uh, rabbi, her wife, a greeting people at the door in a Baptist church of a, in, the, in a Baptist building of a queer church. That's pretty neat. We live in a pretty amazing city here in Halifax. I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, and then again, back to uh, me and, uh, we're almost done with me here. Uh, me with uh, um, publishing. This is Publishing Waves, and we did um, this is back in the 1980s. We did it with a Mac, uh, an old Mac computer and an inkjet printer. <clears throat> and people standing around a table, and we made we uh, put the whole magazine together in an afternoon, uh, having fun. Uh, and it was a chance uh, once a month. This is in the AIDS Coalition office at the time. Uh, once a month, we got together, we did this, and uh, we produced the whole magazine in an afternoon. And it went to the printer, and it went to the distribution. Uh, how many years was uh, the, the paper edition? That well, that's a kind of difficult question because. Uh, uh, it, it, there was a, a long period of evolution. Very shortly after uh, we had an, a gay organization in Halifax uh, in 1972, 50 years ago, there was a newsletter of it, of course, because every organization has a newsletter. That newsletter on and off was called the Gazette, and it was published very sporadically. Uh, and then in the early 80s, um, I got involved. Uh, because I had ink under my fingers and I had to do something. Um, and we were putting out a kind of goofy looking uh, magazine once a month, also called the Gazette. And then a professional um, journalist uh, uh, got involved, a guy named Kevin Crombie, and he said, let's, let's crank this up a notch. And he made it into a completely professional magazine uh, at that point. And and we renamed it because uh, the organization was still called GAE and we wanted to make the ma magazine independent of GAE. It was called the Gay Z, G A E Z. We renamed it Waves. So you could say 50 years, you could say 35 years uh, with, with that name, more or less. Um, this is, and I got involved with history as well because people just started giving me stuff. Uh, and uh, so I, and, and they gave me stories and uh, documents and, um, and facts, and I needed some place to put them because I'm kind of squirrely that way. Uh, and so I created uh, this encyclopedia in about 2000, and it has room for everything. Uh, at this point, uh, here's the A section. Um, there's about 2,000 articles in it, um, and it's got a big span of history. The idea is that there's a page in that encyclopedia for every person, place, thing, and event of significance to the Q community in Halifax ever. Uh, so it starts out, uh, the oldest entry is uh, from 1752, uh, which is a record of um, soldiers uh, being tried for buggery for having sex on. Where's the cruising? Do you know the cruising uh, space on in, Hal uh, in Halifax? Okay, too old for that. Uh, the cruising space, for as long as anyone can remember, has been Citadel Hill. And these soldiers in 1752 were tried for buggery on Citadel Hill. So here we have a cruising space, which arguably or inarguably uh, has, been, uh, has been in use for 300 years. That's pretty cool. Uh, we have a record of Oscar Wilde visiting here in 1892. Yeah, he came here and he delivered a couple, a couple of lectures. Um, he, he, Halifax wasn't very special. He traveled back and forth across North America several times, yeah. delivering the same lectures. Uh, one night, and they were all the same. The one night was a lecture on architecture, and one night was a lecture on aesthetics, I think. And they were held at the, uh, the thing that was before the Capitol Theater at the corner of uh, Spring Garden and uh, Spring Garden and Barrington. Uh, so this so is, you were, uh, me, you were uh, talking about, and you said Halifax, but I'm sure that the rest of the province comes into play. 
Yeah, you have to draw some lines somewhere. Um, I mostly focus on Halifax. If someone came to me and said, hey, we've got this, uh, this really interesting story about uh, Truro or uh, New Glasgow or Sydney, I would certainly not say no uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, a, there's, it's online, there's lots of room, uh, and B, um, there's no other place for it. You know, if, if someone else was creating a history of uh, the Q community in Yarmouth, I would certainly say, I would certainly say, here's all my resources, you're taking it over because I know you can do a better job. But, uh, so absolutely, if that, if, if that ever happens, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, oh, and uh, uh, also, uh, one of the people who died on the Titanic might have been gay, and so there's this kind of debate back and forth about whether he was or not. Um, his name's uh, George Wright. Um, and so, enough about me, enough about the encyclopedia. We're going to burn into some uh, history stuff here. Uh, uh, we don't know a great, and so this is obviously, this is going to be organized by decade, more or less, and I'm going to cut off at about in the 2000s. Um, uh, we don't have a lot of information about what, what happened in before 1970. Uh, Annika, do we have any questions uh, up here before we, before we burn into anything? Not yet, but okay. I have a feeling there's going to be some once you get okay. into the 70s. Okay, come on. Uh, bring it on, people. And uh, the other thing uh, you'll notice is that uh, it's possible uh, that I don't have some facts right here. I expect to hear from people uh, who want to um, make the encyclopedia better. Uh, that's, that's what it's all about, is uh, continuous improvement of this thing. It is not a finished document. So from the, before the 1960s and stuff, we can guess that there were... Um, parties in people's houses. We can guess that there were drag shows in people's houses. Um, we know that there was cruising going on. <coughs> but we don't have any, we don't have any facts about that. We don't have any documents. Uh, sadly, we don't have any letters. What would be great would be to find a cache of letters uh, from someone talking about what a gay life was or lesbian life was in Halifax in 1965. That would be fantastic, you know, writing back to their friend in London or whatever. That would be dr a dream, saying, you know, I went to this party, we had this, here's, here's what all that happened. We don't have anything like that. Maybe it'll show up. Maybe at some point someone will open a, uh, a box of old letters and we'll have it somewhere. So, um, as we know, in 1969, Stonewall happened in New York. Um, that wasn't the first kind of big LGBT thing that happened in North America or the world. It's just the one that we hear about most. most. Wasn't it the first from 1929 or something? All kinds of stuff went on. There was, there was uh, uh, for instance, uh, Berlin was an amazing place in the 1920s for queer folk. Still is. <laughs> and still is, that's right, and is again. Uh, there was a brief time there when it was not such a nice place for queer folk. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, so, and, but we, we hear about Stonewall. That was in 1969, but also a whole bunch of stuff went on in the late 60s that made these things possible. Um, you know, people said, people, everybody, young people said, it's time to change the world. So Stonewall happened, and then, I'm trying to make a shape on the screen here. I can't, I'll do shadow puppets. Um, Stonewall happened, and then, Three years later, in 1972, uh, Halifax had a functional LGBT organization with meetings and a newsletter and a meeting space and people deciding to do things and minutes and resolutions and a budget. And we don't know how that happened. We don't know, at, but we, we can guess because this is how everything happens. We can guess that a bunch of people were sitting around in, in a kitchen around a kitchen table and saying, something has to get done. Something has to happen. We need to do something. But that's just a, we, we can guess that because that's how stuff happens. Uh, we know who uh, uh, that happened with because these are people who signed the doc, who signed the, uh, uh, the initial document of incorporation of uh, GAE. But we don't have that story yet. The story you of, have that in the encyclopedia? Which is that, the uh, incorporation yes. of GAE? Yeah, 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 it's there. Fascinating. Yeah, and so we have the actual date on it. We have a date on which, well, uh, it, yeah. thank you for that segue, Lance. Uh, here's uh, a letter from Ann Fulton. 
the letter stated on oh, November 1972 uh, and says, as of June 4th, 1972, the Halifax Gay Community established an organization known as the Gay Alliance for Equality with an elected executive committee of five. Uh, we plan to register a nonprofit organization. And uh, uh, this is the declaration that, uh, you know, we now have a formal community. Uh, and so um, this is 50 years ago. It would be really great, great to celebrate uh, June 4th, 1972 this year, uh, 50, one half century. Uh, this is Ann Fulton here. And uh, 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 this is the first uh, of the plugs uh, uh, for uh, Lance, you in the audience, uh, to do history. Um, uh, our story with, with Anne is that she, uh, uh, she lived by herself. Uh, she, was one of, she was one of the people who organized the, um, the beginning of our community. Uh, she was, as far as anyone could tell, in perfect health. Uh, and she was a photographer and an archivist herself. And so she had all kinds of stuff in her house, uh, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of photographs uh, of negatives, certainly, and thousands of photographs. And um, one day, five years ago, she called her, seven years ago, she called her a neighbor and said, you know what, I'm not feeling all that great. Uh, and by the time the neighbor got to her house 15 minutes later, she was dead. Um, uh, and there was no, she didn't have a will, uh, and she didn't have a, um, there were no instructions left about what to do. And we, the community, had a sense that her family might be homophobic, and we were terrified, we were concerned that the family was going to come in because they have a right to, it's theirs, it belongs to them, the house belongs to them now, um, and just uh, take everything off to the dumpster. And so we immediately, this is uh, largely a uh, incentive by uh, Robin Metcalf, one of the great historians, uh, the, the great historian of our uh, community, uh, wrote, quickly wrote a letter to the family saying what important materials uh, uh, and had, and it was important that these not be discarded. And we also were prepared to show up at the house and intervene in possibly an unfriendly way, if necessary. Or if they threw stuff into a dumpster for us to retrieve it from the dumpster, we didn't know what was going to happen. Instead, we got a letter back right away saying, uh, we're going to clear out the house on the weekend. It's available to you on Thursday and Friday. Take everything that is relevant to the community. Help yourself. And so we rallied a bunch of people. We went in. So this is one of those cases, you know, this judo move where you go to push someone and instead they grab your hand and pull. The that's, a, that's a really good story. The family grabbed our hand and pulled and we were off balance, but we did it. Yeah. Right. I, I, it's an extraordinary story. I, can we just go back to, quickly back to Stonewall? Just, just to touch base, Stonewall uh, was is credited to drag queens. They were, uh, they were the force that the police were arresting and uh, on Christopher Street, and uh, it went on. And uh, drag queens today continue to play a huge part in our community. Uh, and including here, uh, oh, we, we, yeah, have, yeah, we have a uh, vibrant, very vibrant, we have a very vibrant, vibrant and I, I just wanted to touch base on that in the, in a sense. And that Stonewall riot actually went for a week, did it not? Several days. That's it right. went for several days. Police and uh, drag queens. <laughs> it was a gathering of people, so it was an amazing thing. So I, I just wanted to touch base why some people didn't know about the yeah. Stonewall. There's three tellings of the Stonewall story. Uh, some of them assert that uh, it was uh, racialized uh, uh, drag queens and uh, that uh, were part of it. Um, so there's many tellings of the story, and I encourage you to, to uh, everyone to look up the story and look at the different tellings of it. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, for instance, there's a you know there's a famous part of art of the way the story is standardly told, it says someone picked up a brick and threw it, and, and lots of people have said there were no bricks there. Some, no, one, no one could have thrown a brick at a police car. There were no bricks. Neither of those, I mean, it seems more likely that there were bricks, but 
anyway, there's lots of telling to the story. It's a, it's a super fascinating story. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's one that you can, it's a story that you can tell in a amount of time. I would love to be able to tell that story about Halifax. I would love to say, on, on the, in the summer of 1971, a bunch of people were at a party and they said, we need an organization. And a year later we had, that would be fantastic. Can't do, can't tell that story yet, but maybe it's gonna be in the future. Um, so very shortly after that, um, the Unitarian Universalist Church offered, or we asked, we don't know, we must have asked if we could have meeting space at the, at the UU Church on Oxford Street. And uh, they said, yes. We know this because we can pull minutes. There are minutes out. They're they're not board. What's the uh, what's the thing that's like a board for the Unitarians or for a church? Anyway, the board said we have this request for the uh, LGBT community to use uh, our space for meetings, and they said yes. Uh, and the U that U church uh, has been uh, has been in use by our community for. Quite a while, and I'll, I'll mention it a couple more times as we go through it. They are uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, I do know here in Halifax uh, a great ally. Of, right. Of, of our... and, and the thing that stood out in 1972 is that there were a huge number of churches who would uh, not even say the word homosexual, much less offer to host a group. Um, and the Unitarians said, Of course you can, why not? Um, and probably the Quakers would have as well. And uh, so almost immediately also, uh, we got a uh, interdenominational Christian group called Sparrow formed. So you can see that from the very beginning of an organized community in Halifax, we have had an organized uh, uh, spiritual community as well. Uh, Sparrow was around for, for many, many years. Uh, let me have the, I don't, I don't know the dates on it. Um, uh, Lance, you or someone in the audience, uh, please take it under your wing and, and let's let's do this piece of research and let's let's get the dates and let's find out how Sparrow gelled up and when they gelled up and when they had meetings. Uh, many of the people involved are still alive, but I don't want to be too macabre about it. Think about it. They were young people in 19, uh, 1972. Um, do the math. And we want to be able to uh, get those stories from them while they're still able to tell the stories. Uh, the other thing that gelled up right away uh, is the gay line. And uh, so the uh, organization, uh, JE, started paying for uh, two phone lines. I worked this for many years. I worked, I was a volunteer for the gay line for many years. It was a fantastic way to uh, learn about your city and learn about tech concerns. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we staffed it Thursday to Friday, 7.30 to 10. So three, two and a half hours. Uh, three nights a week and the phone would just ring and someone would ask you a question uh, and the questions were usually where's the cruising area where's the bars uh, where's the bath right because we had a saying we had a saying where the three b's bars baths and bushes uh, and so we just we just had a category for calls we had the, the, the three b was one of the categories for calls uh, but also, every now and then, you get you'd have a call from someone in a troubled emotional state, and you would have to, like, from their tone of voice, this was this was hard work. This is freaking hard work. From their tone of voice, you would have to figure out what their emotional state was, and be in a, be in a position to help them. Um, we had two phone lines because, in theory, someone could have called and been suicidal, and we would have. Could have dialed the other number and and uh, and uh, you know nine one one could have dialed nine one one got help that never happened but we had two phone lines we had a phone line just for that um, and then we got a lot of crank calls as well uh, uh, for a while our uh, phone number wasn't this the phone number changed a couple of times for a while it was sixty nine sixty nine and man people had a lot of fun with that uh, so. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, and the gay line was very long lived. The gay line uh, uh, was, uh, was in existence until 1996, from, from about 1972 to 1976. Pretty organization that's, uh, that's a long lived thing. But of course, the internet comes along, and uh, the need for people to get connected via phone numbers uh, goes down. Um, 
<clears throat> so also in the 70s, um, there were a bunch of bars. Um, and I'm not going to go through the big list of bars. You can look those up on the encyclopedia if you want. Um, uh, several of them were in the uh, on Barrington Street uh, in, the build, in the building called the Green Lantern Building, which has been in the news for the uh, last little while. Uh, and for a while, believe it or not, the Green Lantern Building wasn't all LGBT space, except for the, except for the, uh, this is not the Green Lantern Building, this is another building. Uh, so except for the, uh, there, there were uh, occasionally uh, uh, bars, like once a week or a couple times a month. On the top floor, uh, there was a LGBT bookstore on the, on the second from the top floor. And then there were offices that people were using for apartments, uh, that, the, that the drag community and, and the rest of the community were using for apartments in the building. So it, in ways, it was kind of a huge community center in like 1973, 74, 75. I know this is in Halifax. This is on Barrington Street. Uh, this is uh, this has a bunch of different names depending on who you're talking to. Um, the bottom half just reminds me of 519 in Toronto. Oh yes, right. Where there's a community center uh, for our community in Toronto. The the bar uh, the bar that we had was up here on the top floor. The DJ booth was here in the turret. This, this is this is why the bar was called the turret because of the feature. Um, and we had the rest of the space. For uh, for dance space and uh, and the the bar itself, DJ was enclosed in this part, <clears throat> and so I remember as a teen, I would uh, walk down Barrington Street and I would see the lights flashing in the windows of the of this turret, and I'd be like, and I knew it was a gay bar, and I knew I was gay, um, but I was too young to go, and I would be like, thinking to myself, wow, I bet they're having a lot of fun in there. And walk back and forth, and occasionally look at, you know, see if I could see people going in and out. So uh, very often people refer to this building now as the Kyber, uh, Kyber building. Uh, we uh, elder Q folk uh, more or less will refer to it as the turret. Uh, do you have anything else to say about that? I think if we are just looking at time here, we'll yeah. just keep motoring. Yeah, let's we'll keep motoring. Uh, oh, the other important thing about this uh, bar is that it was not owned by, a, it was not a business, it was owned by the community. We owned it. So what that mean, meant was that all the profits that came out of it went into community projects. So it meant that we had, we had money to do stuff, to, to organize conferences and, uh, uh, and uh, pay for the, for the gay line and send people out to conferences and stuff. Uh, there are only a couple bars in Halifax, in, there are only a couple bars in Canada that were owned by the community. The other one was maybe in Winnipeg or Regina, maybe. 1980s. Um, so, uh, so uh, let's, uh, your opinion. Do you think that 12 step programs are a religious group or a spiritual? spiritual. Yeah, that would be the usual. That would be the, the usual. Uh, that, that's the name they would use for themselves. 1980s, uh, very early on, we got a 12-step uh, alcoholics, uh, LGBT Alcoholics Anonymous group called Live and Let Live. That's their symbol. And a, sh a few years later, they began organizing annual conferences called the Courage Roundup, which were held uh, originally hosted at St. Peter's in Dartmouth, uh, probably because of this uh, amazing out of the closet, very out uh, uh, Roman Catholic uh, priest named uh, Father Louis Casey much beloved by everyone. Um, I think that was his home church. And then um, we moved to uh, the Universalist Unitarian Church, uh, and they've been held there ever since. 1988, so that's, uh, you know, 34-ish uh, years of uh, this conference. Um, yeah. Uh, also 1980s, we had an Affirm United. Um, we don't know. This is another piece of research that needs to get done. We don't know wh when that gelled up. Uh, we don't know exactly who was involved. Uh, that's a piece of research. And then, uh, you know, as long as we're talking about the United Church, we've got uh, a bunch of churches becoming affirming uh, much later. Um, Bedford United, St. John's United. Um, St. John's United, uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, friends with uh, Al Stewart, who was one of the elders at the time. Uh, started talking about uh, becoming affirming probably at least 10 years before it actually happened. 
Um, and in the meantime, while they were still talking, Bedford United Church kind of scooped them, but all good, uh, all's well, it ends well. And so now we've got a, a little stack of affirming churches in uh, in, uh, in Nova Atlanta Scotia, in you know, Atlanta, Canada, yeah. Uh, including uh, Bridgewater, I attended the one in Bridgewater, which was just a couple of years ago, quite, a, quite an event. Uh, and uh, Affirm United, we know, had a had a, a rainbow weekend, Patamagush Center in 2004. Um, there was a um, Seventh-day Adventist group here uh, called Kinship for a while. Um, I, I, I'm almost, I'm certain they're not still meeting. We never had a Mormon group, uh, even though they do exist. Uh, all to the 1980s, uh, organization called Karas, and if you look at the notes, like as an archivist, I get to flip through this, through the actual paper and see the actual things. The first minutes of Karas are typed, uh, Catholics assembled to respond to AIDS. And then the next set of minutes, it's typed, Catholics assembled to respond to AIDS, and the Catholics is crossed out, and church members is written in. <laughs> so we know exactly when they change their name. Uh, to, and decided they're going to uh, spread their wings a little bit. This, again, is a story that needs uh, more research and more telling. So there's the remarkable thing about this is that the time between those first set of minutes and the time that they bought this house and made it into a uh, AIDS hospice, um, you know, because it was the 1980s and lots of people were dying of AIDS, is measured in months. And I normally think of a church stuff happening at the speed of pulled molasses going uphill and how they went from organizing to buying a house in that many months. There's a story there. I know there's a story there. There's some fascinating thing of someone doing heroics and that should be, they should be recognized. That should be documented. It's, it's a super exciting story. Now what happened to Morton? I don't know. Um, uh, I know where it was. I know when we bought it um, because I have, uh, I have the, uh, the real estate agent said, wrote a note and said, here's a picture of Morton House. And we have complete documentation of everything that happened at Morton House. Like, uh, I know on what day the carpenter came in and changed a hinge because I have the receipt for the hinge. Uh, they were uh, amazingly uh, well organized. Um, oh, uh, sh 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 short dalliance here. Uh, 1980s, uh, we had in Nova Scotia, we had a Scandal, I guess you would call. It. Well, the scandal was that it was a scandal, and this was the problem. This is the problem that the Q community had with it: is that uh, in 1980s, uh, mid 1980s, um, oh, 1985, yeah, uh, the uh, uh, media or someone got this story that the naval base in Shelburne was populated by lesbians. It was denoted a lesbian ring. It got into the press. The, of course, the politicians at that point said, well, we have to route out this lesbian ring. And we, uh, the Q community at the time said, A, no, you don't have to make a big deal out of this because there happened to be some lesbians working at this base. B, calling it a ring is really offensive. Um, and C, making it a media circus is also really offensive. And so we had the, this, these, these are notes from the organization. Um, so uh, uh, here we have a handwritten, here's the newsletter. Uh, uh, protest the Shelburne, uh, Shelburne dismissal. So these are women being, or protesting is being uh, dismissed. And uh, these are handwritten notes in the newsletter just before it went to press saying, here's our organizing meeting. Us getting organized for that. Uh, I, I was a kid at the time. Um, I, well, not a kid, um, but uh, I was uh, young. I, I had no idea what a lesbian ring was, and uh, so that was my imagination for for what it was. I thought it was some kind of a dessert. Well, uh, moving right along, the uh, uh, there's a Roman Catholic group called Dignity um, that uh, we don't have any documentation on. We don't know when they were. We don't know the who. We have some idea about the who's, we don't know the when's, we don't know why they gelled up, we don't know uh, when they stopped meeting. That would be a thing. Again, these are in the, uh, all in the 80s. Um, in the 1980s, we had this huge 
sort of Buddhist community called the Shambhalans, moved to Halifax a lot from the U.S. And uh, there was a big community, a Q community that came with them. And so they've had meetings on and off over the years. Uh, this is a very, uh, very well-known picture uh, of a pride march, not a pride parade. Um, July 1st, 1988, uh, a, a protest. Uh, and uh, it was right around that time that the, uh, there was a bunch of people who wore paper bags on their head. Not, say, the people who were there because they were in the closet, but because they were trying to make a point that if legislation was not changed in Nova Scotia, they would have to wear paper bags at work. So um, anyway, the, this paper bag thing is very well known. People, uh, people remember it well. Uh, flipping on to the 1990s, um, a lot of people were dying in the 1990s. These, these, uh, these two were the first people who, uh, first people that a lot of people knew in Halifax who died in the late 80s and in the 90s. Uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic really took hold and we were having people, well-known people in the community die every week. Um, it was a pretty awful time. Um, and these are a couple uh, uh, AIDS quilt panels. Uh, one for Graham Ellis, who was kind of the first person that everybody in the community knew who died. And that was, the, that was a big impact. Uh, and this is uh, Frank Morton's uh, uh, panel, the person for whom that house is named. I can remember literally every week, ages, ages, and ages of photographs of people who died and that, 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 that week. And it just became so depressing to, 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 to get that newspaper at the time. It was, it was so shameful. However, Pitch, the, the pages started to get less and less and less, and great things were happening. Uh, June Caldwell started uh, the, the hospice house, which is still going today. Uh, June Caldwell is a famous, uh, yeah. Anyways, I just want to throw yeah. that in there about, uh, and, uh, that was a tough time for, for the community. Uh, of, of course, uh, the, the hospital, uh, the uh, Victoria General Hospital here in Halifax had an AIDS wing at the time, we don't anymore. Uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and uh, for a while, uh, I think the eighth wing was 8A. And so for a while, uh, you could just, you could just go, you didn't have to have a reason to go to 8A, you just went to 8A and you walked around and visited with your friends who were dying. That was a thing to do. You know, on Tuesday evenings, you would go up to 8A and we'd walk around and visit with people who, you know, at, at the time, you know, you went from not knowing you were sick to being dead in a very short march of months. It was a pretty awful time for that. However, some really wonderful things went on at the same time. Um, this organization, uh, this uh, church called Safe Harbor Church, and then very shortly later became Safe Harbor Metropolitan Community Church, uh, following a very similar, would you guys, would you guys, United Church experts agree that it's, uh, MCC is very much along the lines of uh, of United yeah. Church, following the tradition of United Church, yeah. yeah. And so uh, <coughs> they had very uh, quite a few spaces. This picture is of uh, the their space in Bloomfield Center, but they moved around a lot. Um, they were, I think, for a while in the Unitarian Universalist Church. For at the end, they were meeting in the V House in the North in the North End. For a while, they met in the AIDS Coalition offices. Uh, they had uh, quite a char charismatic. A leader named uh, Reverend Darlene Young, and uh, so we now have uh, a or had up until briefly. I'm not sure if it's going to come back. The Reverend Darlene Young Memorial Dinner, uh, which uh, uh, St. John's United was was running for a while. I'm not quite sure what the status of that is. And that was done through the man, the man. For help. That's right, and it created uh, and uh, they, this they created Manor for Health in 1984. And that was a front. That dinner was a fundraiser for um, and you know, maintained right up until uh, just before, just before our, COVID. Our, uh, before COVID. Yeah. Uh, 
And here, I'm just going to run through a bunch of other stuff. And we had, for many years, we had a LGBT, LGBT friendly wedding chapel. Um, uh, we had a thing called the Spiritual Science Fellowship, which uh, uh, is the second oddest spiritual experience that you will go to ever in Halifax. Uh, I encourage you to go to it. It's, it's, it's very cool. Uh, they meet in the uh, in the Unitarian Universalist. Uh, the most surprising one uh, is this group called the Brahma Kumaras. Uh, that um, and it's a, it's a, an, an amazing experience. Brahma Kumaras is guided meditation, um, and you literally leave your mind, leave the room, leave the province, leave the continent, leave the planet, and then she brings you back. That's what a service is. It's quite an experience. And all, all along quietly, the Quakers. The Quakers don't, didn't make a big deal of it, but uh, they've been uh, open and accepting uh, all, all this time. And uh, 2000s, we're just going to very quickly go through there. Uh, 2000s, so we had the uh, integrity uh, for the Anglicans. And we can see there's a big turnout here in, um, uh, I'm not sure which parade this is, a fairly recent one, a few years ago. Um, uh, integrity started in 2004. I suspect, I, I'm sure that this uh, photo is from much later. And you can see uh, lots of these people have collars on. So we've got uh, ministers coming from all over the place, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and and here's another big list of gay-friendly churches. Anointed Church um, from 2002. Uh, an odd thing called the Messiah Project that I know nothing about. Uh, um, Center of Hope. Uh, 2007, the Shar Shalom. This, uh, this, uh, Conservative synagogues uh, declared themselves uh, LGBT friendly, welcoming, uh, affirming, whatever, whichever word they use, um, uh, because they had a um, rabbi there named uh, Ari Eisenberg who said, "This is the way forward. We cannot, we cannot be, we cannot be, uh, we have to be looking forward at this point." And they've actually, uh, uh, they invited. Uh, LGBT weddings in at the synagogue long before they actually did it. Most organizations, most churches, there's a couple members who say we want to get married and the church figures out how to do it. The synagogue did it the other way around. Uh, 2010, uh, this uh, amazing project called Spirit, uh, Spirit Place, uh, which was a St. John's United uh, uh, project uh, that was slightly before your time, Lance. But we we're going to use that old space at uh, Willow and Windsor, uh, and and provide housing uh, for for everyone, and specifically, uh, you know, a non a safe space for our community. Sadly, that didn't really work out very well. Um, and believe it or not, we had a queer mosque uh, in Halifax for a while, uh, and uh, not meaning a building, but meaning a bunch of people who regularly meet. A bunch of uh, Muslims who regularly meet and worship together. I attended one of the meetings. Um, it was amazing. Uh, okay, and so we're at the end here, and I'm just going to put in another plug for um, uh, doing uh, history work now while you're still able. Uh, what you don't want to happen is uh, a uh, unexpected and forced downsizing, and stuff has to go into the dump. Uh, that's the awful thing. Uh, you don't want boxes of unlabeled photographs left behind. Those are those are just boxes full of sadness. Photos have to have captions uh, because uh, if if as soon as you hand them to someone else, they won't be able to guess who's in the photos. The photos have literally zero value to archivists. Uh, so that's a, a good project. Um, what kind of things go in the archives? I hear you ask. Uh, uh, stories. Uh, if you want to write down a story. We'll take it. If you want to uh, tell a story uh, in an interview, we'll do that. Um, we'll uh, stories of who did what, stories of parties, and uh, good things and bad things, all of those. We have room for all of those in the archives. Uh, we save those usually as audio tapes uh, that are then indexed. Someone listens to them and says, here's the topics the person talks about. So if you're interested in a story about uh, uh, 
uh, the time our community had a squabble about whether men were allowed to wear shirts on the dance floor at Rumors. Uh, you can look that up and you can say, okay, that's at one hour and 26 minutes on this tape and you hit the button and it starts playing. And you hear the story about that from the person who was there. That's pretty cool. Uh, physical objects go into the archives as well. Um, documents, photos, uh, video and audio and memorabilia. And this thing, uh, particularly precious, called, we call it ephemera. It's, po it's stuff that's not meant to be saved. So tickets to things, posters of things, announcements of things, uh, that's uh, a very cool uh, the oral histories, where we sit down and we do an interview with you. Um, this is Helen Creighton, uh, this picture here, uh, my hero. Uh, this, is in, this must have been in the 1950s because she's got uh, audio tape there and we know that audio, that magnetic tape didn't exist um, before World War II. And here she is out in some, out in the boonies somewhere with this monster tape recorder that she lugged around. She's got her microphone set up here. And she's getting this, this guy to tell stories or sing. We don't know what, because she collected a lot of songs. Um, and she tried to, like, there's other pictures of her with this tape recorder in a wheelbarrow. And she's walking down a, uh, a path with the tape recorder in a wheelbarrow. What a hero. Uh, what an amazing person. And, you know, we've got all this history recorded because of her. Uh, if you want to learn more about history, where do you go? Well, uh, there's the encyclopedia. Uh, to get to the encyclopedia, type gay in Halifax and any topic, and you'll get a hit on some page, uh, probably in there. Uh, Rebecca Rose has built, has uh, built, has written this fantastic book called uh, Before the Parade, uh, which gives in much greater and much more accurate detail all the stuff that we've run over, uh, less churchy stuff uh, than we <laughs> uh, than we've done uh, tonight, uh, and. Uh, we also have an LGBT archives, which is housed at Dell. And so if you're doing uh, research, you can actually ask them. You can say, do you have anything on this topic? And they can say yes or no and get it for you. Yes, I was thinking about the uh, archives there. They're very interesting. Yeah, I, I must get I must get there. Um, I have to thank you. you it was just uh, a super, okay. super. How can you contribute? Stories, materials, photos, uh, volunteer. Um, contact me if you want to, uh, when you want to volunteer, that would be always good work. And you can always contribute dollars and contact me to find out how, how to do that. Uh, that's it. That's it for me. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, a truly informative evening. Can we go uh, over time and ha answer questions if there are any? Yes, of course. I have and, one. Um, okay. And there are, there's a comment from Margo, and, and she's giving you a tidbit of information. Uh, she thinks that the priest, Mike McDonald, who also had AIDS, was helpful in establishing Morton House. Yeah, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. And my question is, what words of hope do you have for young people who um, don't have an organization in their school or church that they feel they can turn to? Um, do you have any words of hope about them organizing or um, where they could potentially call or uh, to get information or talk to someone about organizing more? Just what, what kind of words of wisdom do you have? Well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, a lot of schools, luckily these days, do have things called GSAs, uh, which used to stand for Gay and Straight Alliance, but it doesn't anymore. And I can't remember what it now stands for. Gender and sexuality. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's right. That's where we are right now. Uh, uh, but the, these the, these organizations called GSAs exist in many, many, I, I can't say all high schools, but many of them. Um, and, sadly, not all, and sadly, only a yeah. few middle schools. Uh, and we also have uh, several organizations here in Halifax and one in, uh, and others distributed around uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, there's a youth project in Halifax with something a lot like the youth project over in Dartmouth, whose name I can't remember, but there's, it's, a, it's a specific youth um, uh, youth organization that has a, a, a big uh, uh, focus on queer youth. Uh, they were involved heavily with the Pride uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, and there are other, um, 
organizations around the province in Bridgewater and Wolfville uh, and probably a few other places as well. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have those at the tip of my hands, but tip of my fingers, but uh, uh, there are organizations which will welcome them and they can get, they can get involved. And if it's, you know, uh, remote, a lot of these organizations are now uh, holding meetings online. Yes, like the play, uh, exactly. there's all sorts of uh, things. Again, Dan, thank you very much. I just want to do a, a, a little plugging for the rest of our week here. Okay. Um, and I, I do apologize for the beginning of our, I was a little uh, nervous. And so now I'm ready to really tell you <laughs> some things that I wanted to tell you at the very beginning. Pi Day started in 2019 by the Affirming Connections Affirmed Church, which has quickly become the United Church favorite holiday. Pi stands for Public Intentional Explicit. At St. John's, we hosted our first Pi Day on March 14, 2020. In 2021, we launched our GSA on Pi Day. And uh, in 2022, we decided that Pi Day is too good to only have once a year, and so we decided to make it a four-day event. Um, I, I think it was two years ago, uh, a couple of us volunteered to have pies thrown uh, in our face, and we raised a, a good amount of money, and uh, I, I'm just looking at uh, uh, the hard work of our, uh, our principal minister, uh, Hubert, is here, and uh, we both, I, I was the other pie uh, taker. Um, it was wonderful to have Dan here tonight and Dan has been a great help in putting us with the connection with a lot of people uh, for our upcoming events. I have to remind you that tomorrow night, seven o'clock, your Zoom uh, uh, number will stay the same and it's movie night tomorrow night and our uh, wonderful uh, uh, spiritual uh, minister, Annika. Spiritual will growth be... and outreach. It's okay. Spiritual growth and outreach. It's a long title. <laughs> I'm Lance Old and Gray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have movie night, and you can have a, a vote on it. Uh, the movies are Fairhaven. Friends America, Uncle Frank. So you have some good choices there. Uncle Frank, Uncle Frank. <laughs> Uncle Frank is a good man. Yeah. Um, and Saturday night, we have just a really exciting night. We have music and poetry night, a collage of rainbow songs, poetry, and art. Uh, we'll be featuring uh, Paul Healy from our, our, our own congregation, Pat Brennan Albert, Nolan Natashi and Ken McCabe, a butter guest. Uh, Paul Healy is uh, St. John's regular. Paul's gift of singing travels with him in his daily life and his work. Um, he's a great storyteller and poetry. And Paul has written an original piece for this event. And uh, I have been privy to hear it. And it is phenomenal and please join us on Saturday night. Nolan is a queer trans writer, performer, and filmmaker. Nolan lives in North End and has a way with words that is getting noticed and nominated. Nolan is a perfect fit for a rainbow arts college collage. Kenna McCabe is a queer indigenous artist whose spiritual journey is summarized in Living in the Flow. It's episode six and Kun's particular passion for mental health and the importance of water will inspire, uh, inspire us to live the flow too. And an incredible story. You will be, he's such a wonderful young man, incredible story, you'll really enjoy him. And we have much more music and a lot of fun. Sunday, we ask you to join us uh, for worship service uh, here at uh, St. John's United at the uh, Conservatory for Music um, at 1030. It will be in celebration 
of our affirming. We have great programs and we have a great reflection given by uh, um, a couple of members of our church who are actually leaders and participatory people in making uh, our church affirmed and welcoming. And we at St. John's just want to remind everybody that we have been affirmed for 15 years. That is a wonderful thing. And also, you will be able to start bidding via uh, voting uh, for your pie. It's a silent auction. We are raising money. We need. I said at church last Sunday and nobody responded, but anyways, we need money. Our GSA has been going for a couple of years. We have done some pretty sincere projects. We've got some big ones coming up and uh, we would like to raise enough money. So we're hoping with our pies and anybody who would just like to support our GSA, please uh, just uh, get in touch with St. John's and we'll tell you how to. Uh, send money so uh, that's my pitch on on monday or on money monday march 14th i alluded before we will be uh, announcing the uh, winners of the highest bids for the pies and the pies will be delivered on tuesday our guest speaker is the right reverend gary patterson and uh, the pie auction is on monday this will be a, a wonderful event. It's live. Uh, the Right Reverend Gary Patterson is, will be doing it from Vancouver. Our uh, principal pastor, uh, Hubert, will be doing the interview and uh, we're encouraging all people, if they have any questions, uh, there will be a Q&A and uh, we're really looking forward to it. And we like to think that we got a we had a great start with Dan, and uh, we're really excited for the rest of our Pi Day celebration. Please join us tomorrow night at seven o'clock, Saturday night at seven o'clock, Sunday at ten thirty at church, and Monday night at seven o'clock again. Thank you all for joining us. We thank you. We give you our best, and we'll see you soon. See you tomorrow night at the movies. <laughs>